All right, welcome everyone to the show tonight. So excited to be hosting tonight's discussion on faith and the holidays on behalf of the Oklahoma Conference of Churches Religions United Committee. My name is Adam Soltani. Many of you know me as the Executive Director of the Council on American Islamic Relations Oklahoma Chapter. I'm also an adjunct professor of Islamic studies at Oklahoma State University. But one of my favorite things, and definitely uh, one of the most important things that I feel that I am able to do and blessed to, with the opportunity to do, is to be a part of the Religions United Committee, and something that I have been involved with since 2012, along with several other, other outstanding and dedicated individuals in the Oklahoma City metro areas, as well as across the state, who are committed to interfaith dialogue and to helping establish a better understanding of what it means to be a person of faith in the state of Oklahoma and what it means to have a diverse faith community. So why don't we get started by going around and allowing everyone a minute or two to introduce themselves. Let's start with uh, Emma and then Mike and Shabon, if we could. Okay. Do you want me to start? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, I'm Emma East. I am a the founder, uh, director, and a priestess at Labyrinth Temple which is Pagan Space and Resource Center. Um, it's a physical building here in Hilton Park. We've been open for a couple of years with the building, and but the labyrinth, which is in the back, a 40-foot labyrinth that's open 24-7, that was installed in 2014. And we've, wow. been doing, we've been gathering it there for all that time. Plus, I came here from Tampa in the year 2000 and just started my work here as well. Uh, 15 years there, 20 years here. Wow, so, wonderful. And that was the Labyrinth Temple, you said? The temple, yes. Wonderful. For the viewers and, uh, out there, can they find it on the internet? If they're interested, they can Google about it? Yes, we have a Facebook page and a website. Uh, you just have to type in Labyrinth Temple and we'll be poop, pop right Perfect. on the first top of the list. Wonderful. So, Wonderful. But I always really want to make sure people can discover more information if they're interested. And Mike, can you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? I will do that. Uh, I'm Mike Kornblit. I am of the Jewish faith. I belong to the uh, Temple B'nai Israel and to the Emanuel Synagogue here in Oklahoma City. Uh, I am with an organ founder, uh, co-founder of an organization called the Respect Diversity Foundation. Uh, we are an educational foundation teaching understanding, respect, and acceptance for all people, no matter their differences. I also happen to be a member of the Religions United Committee, uh, which I have been on for a number of years as well and have worked with Adam over the years. And uh, so it's always important to interfaith with the other faith communities in, uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, because there are a number of them, even though a lot of people don't think that's the case. So it's so important that uh, that we come together and uh, and share uh, who we are and what our communities are. That's right. And Mike, you know where to get the best cinnamon rolls in Stillwater, right? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep that between us for now. But yeah, yeah, maybe maybe we'll be able to take some of the other guests after COVID. All that right, and good. and Shabon, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, so, sir. <clears throat> My name is uh, Chabon Colonel, and I'm a member of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma and also of Muscogee Creek uh, origin. Um, I'm a traditional practitioner is what we would say, uh, ceremonial grounds, uh, some of our ancient ways of spirituality and taking care of ourselves that goes back thousands of years for our Native American community. Um, this is how I've raised my, my family. But um, I'm also uh, ordained within the United Methodist Church and currently professionally and the executive director of our national plan for Native American ministries. And the core of the work is helping to ensure that an entity that has a violent history in treating indigenous peoples of this continent lives in a healthy manner. So that's a lot of the work that I do is trying to teach and show where that harm has occurred. 
So it's um, this is a, a little bit of what uh, I've been working on the past few years. Currently, I'm also one of two North American representatives of indigenous peoples that sit on the World Council of Churches um, Indigenous Peoples uh, Forum. So um, we try to do the best that we can to help throughout the world in alleviating some of the harms that have been inflicted by the, the Christian faith. But it's a, a pleasure to be here tonight with each one of, each one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, of course, tonight we're talking about faith. And as many of the viewers probably know, one of the things that oftentimes this time of the year is referred to as the holiday season. Um, for whatever reason, you know, you've got Halloween and then Thanksgiving, and then um, you've got uh, Christmas and then Hanukkah. And sometimes you have Ramadan, we'll talk about that in a minute, and uh, the Eid holidays within the Muslim tradition, right? So a lot of times people say, oh, this is a holiday season, a very festive time, you know, Christmas trees everywhere, um, and people are in a joyous mood, as they say. But one of the goals we want to achieve tonight is really talking about what does holidays mean to different faith communities, number one, and also hopefully for the viewers to recognize that not everybody is partaking in holidays at this time of the year, or perhaps even if they are, they may not be the most important holidays for that individual faith tradition. So, Mike, let's start with you, uh, because I know a lot of times people think of Hanukkah as this big, you know, festive Jewish holiday, but you and I know that it's also it's one of the less significant holidays, if you will, within the Jewish faith tradition. So can you talk about Hanukkah and also maybe talk about what are really the most important times of the year within the Jewish community. Okay, you, you're, muted, you're cutting, cutting in and out. I can't, I couldn't understand the question. Adam, would you repeat that? Uh, Emma had a hard time understanding what. Yeah, you were so saying just want to hear from from each of you. What are the most important times of the year, if there are some, in in relation to your uh, faith tradition? Um, and wanted to start with Mike from the Jewish community. Uh, yeah, we have a, a Hanukkah. It starts, I think it's December 9th, somewhere around there. Uh, many times it will cross Christmas and people think, well, if it's Christmas time, it must be Hanukkah. Uh, but because we uh, are very much like the Muslim community, uh, we go with the lunar calendar. So it shifts uh, every year about when holidays are, uh, each of the holidays. Hanukkah was uh, came about because of the uh, uh, the destruction of uh, uh, the second time that the Romans destroyed the uh, temple in Jerusalem, and a band, a family called the Maccabees, uh, got together and were going to uh, fight the Romans and try and throw them out, drive them out, and there was a long war that ensued. And finally, uh, the father died, and uh, his son Judah took over. And Judah Maccabee was the one who defeated uh, the Romans and came back into Jerusalem and reestablished the temple uh, in Jerusalem. And as the story goes, and there's a debate, as there always is, and when you go back thousands of years, that uh, the Jewish temple always had a light, a burning of oil, uh, always a, a light to God. And so there was very little oil in the in the in the candle labra that uh, uh, was lit and they didn't think there would be enough uh, for it to last and what ended up happening they sent people out to get more oil to keep the light burning and miraculously the little oil that was there lasted for eight days thus giving us the symbol of hanukkah of eight days and what we do on that holiday is we have an eight or nine candle uh, candelabra. Uh, one is the shamus, which lights all the other candles. And the first night of Hanukkah, you light the shamus, which lights the first candle. Then the second night, you light the shamus and two candles until you go through the eight days and you say the blessings every night. And, uh, and there's a celebration and it's a lot of uh, fried food is what is good, <laughs> uh, called potato latkes, which are uh, uh, Those great, are great good. Have. I have had yeah. them. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So that's really uh, uh, 
wonderful. Uh, so that is associated really at this time of the year with Christmas. So everyone thinks, you know, so when you were talking about Christmas trees everywhere, uh, Jewish people would say that they were Hanukkah bushes, you know, that are out there. So, <laughs> right. Uh, so it is, it's, it's really more of a secular holiday than a religious holiday. It's uh, mm. not, it's, it's one of the minor holidays in, in Jewish tradition. Right. Although it is important and it's a fun holiday, which uh, people really enjoy. But what, if you what start, would be, what would be the most significant holiday in in the Jewish tradition? You would say, like I think Christmas and Easter are pretty high up there on the Christian calendar. So, what would you say is the equivalent of those types of holidays? Okay, the holidays uh, really are kind of broken down to biblical holidays and to uh, rabbinic holidays that the rabbis uh, kind of created uh, right. uh, throughout uh, history, and then the post rabbinic. Uh, holidays, but the most important are the, are the under the biblical holidays, which, believe it or not, is not really a. It's a single day, but it is one that everybody actually uh, uh, probably observes, and that's Shabbat. You know, taking a day of rest, mm -hmm. uh, starting Friday evening and going to Saturday evening, which is the most uh, important uh, actually holiday mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we celebrate. But when you get to the other kinds of holidays, you talked about Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year, which uh, I'm sure Shabon can identify with this. Our year is 5781, where mm. uh, Native American, the indigenous people, it's uh, probably not, not 2020 for them either. So, uh, and then the second one would be Yom Kippur which comes 10 days after Rosh Hashanah, which right. is the Day of Atonement, which is right. uh, the day that uh, we ask God's forgiveness for any sins that we have committed. It is a day of fasting. Mm -hmm. uh, but a day that comes right before there, which I think is more important. Yom Kippur, you ask for God's forgiveness for any sins you may have committed. But Arab Yom Kippur is the day that you ask human beings for their forgiveness for any sins that you've committed, which I think is, is is just as important to ask forgiveness from your fellow human beings. Yeah. So those would be the three most important. But one that actually is a kind of uh, similar to Thanksgiving that we're coming up to first would be Sukkot. Mm. Uh, Sukkot uh, is the holiday of the huts. Uh, that is the time when uh, the Jews were in the desert and God protected them by building these little shelters from the uh, from the desert and everything that was going on. So after uh, the Jews wandered for those 40 years, God commanded them to uh, celebrate Sukkot by going out and building huts for uh, the seven day period and right. to live in the huts, uh, three sided with an opening door where you invite guests, strangers in and you have big feast. It's uh, the, it's mm -hmm. the autumn time uh, right. as well when you do the harvest. So that's kind of related to this holiday that we have that, that's coming up. There is even some history that says uh, that the pilgrims actually lived in Holland after they fled England mm. uh, uh, because of religious persecution. And they lived among the Sephardic Jews who had come from uh, Spain uh, to live in Holland and that they were there together and they learned about Sukkot because the Jews mm -hmm. were observing Sukkot at that, you know, during that time. And that uh, they ended up coming and, of course, then had the first Thanksgiving with the indigenous people here. And, uh, you know, someone, some people have identified, you know, well, maybe that's where they first learned about Thanksgiving. So whether that's true or not, but it's a good myth. So wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Mike, so much. Really Truly appreciate your insight there. And, you know, just like within the Jewish tradition, within the Islamic tradition, me being a Muslim, you know, we also have very significant times of the year. And much like in Judaism, they change. They're not the same. I oftentimes, I, I teach an introduction to world religions class. And I oftentimes ask my students, when is the month of Ramadan? And they start saying this month and that month. And I say, you're all wrong. It's a trick question. It moves back 11 days a year. So when I was 17, 20 years ago, I started fasting for the first time, the only month of Ramadan when I accepted Islam. And it was in the month of December. I was like this. And this is the holiest month of the year for Muslims. It's a month long, not holiday, but holy time that ends with the Eid al-Fitr, 
holiday, which makes that time so joyous and so festive. But it's 30 days of no eating and no drinking from sunup to sundown. And I started fasting at 17, like this is a piece of cake because the days are shorter in December. And then of course I grew up and as I got older, here it was August, July, and we're fasting for 18, 19, 20 hours. And I was like, wow, what did I sign up for, right? <laughs> Can I get a refund? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It's a bad joke. Um, but the point is uh, the times change. So it's a trick question, but the holiest times for Muslims are actually only two. The day, the last day after the month of fasting, which is Eid al-Fitr, and that is the day that celebrates the breaking of the fast. Everyone's happy because we call it return of coffee, right? You can drink coffee during daylight hours again. And then the Eid al-Adha holiday, which is a holiday that commemorates the pinnacle of the Hajj pilgrimage. There are some other minor holidays within the Islamic faith tradition, but those are the two big ones that I wanted to mention. Um, Emma. With regards to the Labyrinth Temple and the pagan tradition, are there some uh, special times of the year or significant holidays that you have that you would like to share with us? Since we're agriculturally based, um, most of our holidays center around the either the phase of the moon uh, or as the events, uh, solstices and equinoxes in the cross quarter days. Um, the cross quarter days are tend to be the more significant, um, where the solstices and equinox are a little bit lesser, but more recognizable. So, um, so we have three harvest festivals. We have uh, Lunasa in the summer, and then Litha in the fall, and Samhain is the is the last one. Halloween, is the last one, and so at each stage of those harvests, we celebrate a different aspect of um, uh, bringing it bringing it back home, bringing it in, taking care of it, being uh, mindful of our consumption and mm -hmm. using it a lot in a metaphorical sense and to let go of things we don't need anymore, um, mm -hmm. to uh, express a lot of gratitude gratitude is big <laughs> it's like the pin point where big things keep coming around and around so mm -hmm. we we spend a lot of time with gratitude and um and then in the winter we have yule which is ancient mm -hmm. and celebrated uh, and differently all over the world but um, many of the european customs were of early pagans, of uh, early pastoral people, were incorporated into later religions mm. to help adjust the populace to the new paradigm. So for Yule, we incorporate a lot of the world's traditions because we all come from different backgrounds. Christmas, you know, we'll have tree. The tree is very pagan mm. and decorating with lights, the rebirth of the sun, S-U-N versus S-O-N, mm. the um, opportunity to, um, to be generous and uh, think about other people. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of leeway on how, pagans celebrate uh, mm. these holidays, these winter holidays. And like Christianity, uh, pagan, the term pagan is just this giant umbrella for anything that's basically not of the Abrahamic traditions. Mm. So, um, so we encompass everything. If you'll see behind me, um, can't see it perfectly, but mm. there, there it is. We've been celebrating Holly, uh, not Holly, uh, Diwali all week Beautiful. and uh, with a Diwali altar and with Asia and uh, the um, um, Lakshmi. So it's been interesting to learn about that tradition and to have some expression around that mm -hmm. as well. So I like to integrate other spiritual traditions and fold them together to see how we can overlap and uh, co-create a spiritual experience that can speak to a lot of people 
not just a certain person. So, yeah. Wow. That was fascinating and very insightful. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that information. And last but not least, Shabon, uh, very interested to hear what you have to say in particular because you're essentially combining two traditions, the indigenous traditions and, of course, the Christian tradition, as you mentioned, under the United Methodist, the United Methodist Church of Christ. So if you could please speak to both and talk about the how kind of I'm, I'm really interested not only in, you know, the important aspects of holidays and what are the important holidays from both traditions, but also how those mesh together. Mm -hmm. No, um, and, and just so everyone knows, there are entire courses that help people deconstruct what history has constructed in the understanding of how do we exist with those mm. multiple identities and faith. Uh, that's really what I try to do is put a little bit of the pieces together. Uh, first and foremost, to, to answer the question about the, the biggest, you know, our holiday within Southeastern tribal cultures, communities, is something that we've been doing for, you know, really literally eons. You know, even as I'm listening to each of my relatives talk about their particular tradition, I see so many commonalities in our understanding of existence that our people come out of what we call mound builder societies all throughout, you know, um, this this country. Um, you know, we, we pre-exist before the United States. Um, you know, we, our, our, our ways of life have been a part of traditional practices for, you know, they're thinking about, you know, some over, uh, you know, 1200 years is what we're thinking. So in its current form. So mm -hmm. we've been able to maintain despite genocide and assimilation is that we still have the, the main harvest is what, you know, we would call it our Agilani and Bosqueda, which is the harvesting of uh, green corn, the fresh corn. And if you look all throughout what is called the Americas, there's an, a story of the origin of corn that mm -hmm. throughout all of the Eastern United States into Central and South America, even in Southwestern US with our, our Native American communities, there's a story about where that comes from. And so, so too, we're a part of that. And so our entire cosmology that we've been able to maintain is centered around that harvesting. So that's the biggest, the holiest time for us is when we prepare for that which is usually late summer, uh, maybe early fall for some communities, it just kind of depends. And that's really what people kind of consider our new year, our renewal, you know, we do a period of fasting, we do a period of cleansing of ourselves, certain pra practices that we've been doing. Wow. Um, and, and this is how I've raised my family, my, my children, to, to make this conscious decision. So usually for our particular community in Eastern Oklahoma, this is around maybe mid-August, uh, something to that effect. Um, so we're, we're able to uh, to still partake in that and, and do those things, even though in, in this day and age, finding the per particular herbs and plants that we use for our cleansing and our well-being are getting more and more difficult to uh, find. But even if they're there with uh, laws and property, things of that nature, um, it's very difficult to get them to harvest. So that's our biggest time. And so it's, it's a moment of joy. It's a moment of feasting. Um, it's a moment of preparing us for the winter months, which for us within the indigenous communities of North America, we really looked at it as it's, um, we are susceptible to moving on to the next phase of life, I guess you could say, um, because the winters could be so harsh. We could go without food, we could go without uh, shelter, and we become susceptible to the elements where we might, you know, we might, we had a, lo a lot of loss of life during mm -hmm. that. So we really try to make sure that when we have that moment of of the harvest that it's taken in reverently. And so that's what we try to do. So usually late summer, early fall. During this particular time of year, though, what we'll find is some of our communities that are still, now this is primarily Southeastern, Muscogee Creek, Seminole communities, that we actually have, it's, it's, it's kind of like everyone else talking, it's a lesser of a day. I don't know if I would call it a holiday. It's just a part of our, our cosmology but we find ourselves having these special meals um, that we have. For us, we call it a, a soup drink, where we put everything on the ground and we put offering of each one of those foods onto the ground because it symbolizes, and really, it's not just a symbolism, it's really, um, uh, we actually believe in the physical presence of our ancestors that we're feeding this earth, because this is where we return to the energy that we possess as human beings. We'll go back into this mother earth uh, energy and so we're, we're mindful of that in our life. 
So it was just a, maybe a couple of weeks ago that we had that moment of recognizing, of grounding ourselves, of remembering that, you know, of our place in all of creation and our connection to all of the cosmos, so to speak. And so that's something that we, uh, we are doing right now. And to try to give a, a small or a brief attempt at, now, how do, we, how do we understand that in the context of even Christianity? As I was making mention of during the introduction, introductions, that we have to first acknowledge that there's been certain levels of violence that this particular faith has done towards the indigenous peoples of this continent. You know, the forbidding of our languages, the forbidding of our spiritual practices, you know, the forbidding of even uh, clothing and regalias uh, historically, you know, and I, and I can't even speak about that in past tense because there are still some communities of faith still discriminating against that today. Wow. Uh, so it's really kind of a, a kind of almost a chaotic kind of approach because in some circles there are people there are communities that are able to combine so to speak you know these kind of uh, cosmologies uh, these particular faiths and so I, I actually this is a time of year where a lot of that combination is a little bit more um, I guess for lack of a better term safer because mm -hmm. um, we're able to do things in conjunction with whether it's Christmas or whether it's you know, a Thanksgiving feast or a holiday, so to speak. So you'll see a lot of uh, special uh, moments where uh, you might see churches uh, coming together for that 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 holiday meal without even fully realizing that this is a practice mm -hmm. of feasting and enjoying that abundance. That was the origin of some of those uh, first moments that we are now calling uh, Thanksgiving, that hosp uh, hospitality and reciprocity that we understood as indigenous peoples, you know, was always something that we would offer. It's the foundation of our existence. There's no limitation to that uh, mm -hmm. hospitality, you know, even to our own uh, detriment, so to speak. And so we start to see uh, Christian communities of, uh, of faith starting to do that more. So you'll see uh, different churches having those type of meals uh, during this time of year. But the two components that I think were the, that were the most easy to kind of uh, incorporate were our understanding of the role of our children and the understanding of the importance and reverence for a day. That goes into a deeper indigenous cosmology that we're always reverent. You know, we don't, we're asked never to count uh, people, never to count days because it, it kind of, it's a way of not understanding the, the true value of one given moment. So we don't, we don't, we put less emphasis on, well, I've, you know, I'm, 43 years old, or this what yeah. the more important fact is that I'm here today. I'm present in this one moment. That carries over into our cosmology. So we are always looking for a moment to engage each other, our neighbor, our relatives, our families, every moment that it's, mm -hmm. it's a reverence, it's a spiritual moment of saying, this is something that we don't know how many we have, but we have this moment right now and we're gonna, you know, we're going to live to the fullest, so to speak. But the other, the second piece of that is uh, important in our cosmology as indigenous peoples is our understanding of children. Uh, everything that we do, we think about those, the future lives that are about to come. You know, you may have heard uh, other tribes say, we think seven generations ahead, the decisions that we make now will have an impact for seven generations from now. You know, even uh, we had a similar understanding in Southeastern ways, but for us, the most purest of all of creation are those little ones. And, you know, the, the things that the purity that they bring into this life because they haven't been tainted by everything that we go through, you know, the, the anger of politics, you know, the anger of, you know, discrimination, all of these things that we have to overcome every day, they haven't seen that. And so they're, they're pure. And for us, they were most in the presence of that spirit world, whatever it may be, however we define it, they were most recently in the presence of that. So we're asked never to uh, to take away from that energy and that spirit. And so that parallels very conveniently with the Christian holiday of Christmas, of giving joy to the children, of, you know, having, you know, gatherings and, you know, sacks of candy, those kinds of things. And so you see some of our communities really meshing that a lot. So we'll have a special moment for our children of making sure they have, you know, all of the things that uh, life can uh, can give for them. And so for us, you know, we've kind of um, seen different people kind of mix those. But it, I will say it's a, it's a work in progress because there are still some communities 
uh, that are you would consider. I don't use this language to fully uh, Native American. F some people would say full bloods. I would say culturally literate. Um, that would not do anything, have any connection to uh, our traditional origins, those kinds of things. So mm. you kind of people, depending on what part of the country, what tribal community they're a part of, you see them kind of uh, doing the best they can to navigate um, that history that exists between uh, between the two. Wow, wow, that was, that was that heavy. Was and that was a lot of good information. And I feel like that's something to really think about, you know, and, and I appreciate you for sharing the challenges, you know, that, that are involved in navigating being both uh, a member of an indigenous tribe and indigenous population, as well as identifying with the Christian faith. I would ask questions, but but I don't want to run out of time because we, you know, we have so much. But but hopefully we can continue this discussion. Uh, Javon, if you don't mind me asking, how you know? Because I'm sure others will probably have more questions. Real quickly, is there an easy way for people to get in touch with you before we move on to our next guest? So if they have more questions about this, they can contact you. Absolutely. Uh, the the most easy way right now. I don't use a lot of social media platforms, but I am on Facebook, just like it says on here, Chabon Colonel. Uh, right. That's really the the easiest way. And then you can have access to my uh, email and things of that nature. But that's the one I use uh, primarily. Thank you. Thank you. So if you have, if you'd like to engage with Chabon more about this topic, please do uh, connect with him on Facebook. And we have uh, another guest who just joined us, uh, Kwame. Uh, can you please introduce yourself and tell us uh, which faith community you're with? My name is uh, Kwame Mbaya. I am with. I am not with any religious faith at all. Nomination. Okay. I um, I was a Christian, but I am not a Christian now because of various reasons. What we won't go into. But uh, yes, Kwame Mbaya, and I have uh, been invited to talk about Kwanzaa. Okay. which I've been celebrating with my family um, over 40 years, almost ever since Kwanzaa was presented in, I believe, like 1967. So, wow. uh, yes, I have been doing this Kwanzaa, and I've come to Oklahoma City probably 12 years ago, and to further uh, celebrate with the community of uh, African you know, Black people the tradition of Kwanzaa from uh, the day after Christmas until January the 1st. Okay. And can you tell us more? Uh, we've already gone around and talked about the different uh, holidays and what they mean. Can you tell us more about Kwanzaa and why it's significant, who celebrates it, and what are what are some of the you know things that are part of that celebration, if you will? Kwanzaa is traditionally a African African American or a black holiday. As I said, it was celebrated a day after Christmas to the first seven days. And it composed of seven principles, what we call the Nguba Saba. These symbols, these are not symbols, these traditions or statements are really in line to pull the black community together and deal with certain things as far as like emoji, which means unity, which is the first day. And each day, there are seven days. And each day there is a principle in the bar, which I say is called the Nguba Saba. And we practice these and we try to put those or put them into our everyday living so Kwanzaa will not be just a practice that is done uh, during this time. So we can incorporate into our life, our lifestyle. As I said, uh, uh, the first one, emoji, which means un unity, which jackalio, which means self-determination, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, 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 it's a good holiday. And basically, it was uh, set up in, in California. And it has broad, it has gone like wow for both mm -hmm. the United States, not also the United States, to African countries and by African America, it's in Caribbean or in Africa or in the Netherlands or in South America and Europe or whatever. But it's a tradition or a holiday that is widely, widely celebrated among African people. 
Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, my next question for all the guests, and we can circle back around as the way it appears on my screen. We'll start with you, Emma. But, you know, one of the questions people have this time of the year, and I think it's an important one. I'll leave the harder one for last. Actually, I have a two-parter, but I'll leave the second part for last. In particular, as it pertains to Christmas, I think, you know, living in America, people because Christmas has become such a cultural holiday within the American, you know, ecosystem, if you will. And it's almost accepted as, you know, a part of American life. And for some people would argue has become more commercialized than anything else. Um, but the question is, do you, from your faith tradition, recognize and or celebrate Christmas? And if not, how do you deal with Christmas? Like meaning if people want invite you to celebrations or they want to give you a gift or, you know, you like at workplaces, they have secret Santa. These are challenges that I face as a Muslim, which I'll talk about later. But Emma, let's start with you. I'm curious. And then we'll go move to Mike, Chaban, Kwame, and then I'll, I'll finish off with my perspective. You're, you're muted, Emma. Um, because all of us come from different backgrounds, uh, paganism in general is both reconstructed and newly constructed as a, uh, a spiritual tradition, and there's hundreds. So each family pretty much decides for themselves whether they want to participate in in Christmas celebrations or, you know, uh, uh, go do the normal, the, the not so normal, but the traditional mm. things with their families, you know, their dinners and their maybe go to, you know, the church and, and uh, do the uh, nativity plays with their children. I mean, it's, it's a broad, it's a broad range of uh, um, activities mm. that, surround uh, Yule and Christmas. And because so many of the symbols are early, early symbols, I mean, we incorporate them into our environments, mm -hmm. you know, and look just like your neighbor, okay? Because, you know, we'll have a tr decorated tree, you know, we'll make bake cookies to share. You know, it's uh, uh, the, the wreath on the door, you know, that's, you know, we'll create one of those to, represent possibly prosperity in the new year and the evergreens. Mm -hmm. And um, so we generally don't have a problem with integrating into the season because, well, not only is Christianity just out there, there are a lot of other faith traditions that uh, are expressing their sentiments this time of the year. The, uh, overcoming the darkness with the light mm. uh the the birth of the christ child would be you know literally the birth of the sun you know mm. uh, um so and we can uh anthropomorphize that into a physical form um i have a cookie jar that's a native american mother holding a baby you know so that might show up on the altar um same with a lot of things having to do with angels. There seems to be a lot of people in our community that relate to angels. And mm -hmm. since we're not into prescribing a particular belief system to anybody or practice to anybody, um, we kind of accept what we can and let go of what we can't. Okay. Uh, Halloween is a much more difficult holiday for us to transition with uh. because there's so much um, negative attitudes about uh, witches and uh, mm. death. And so while we look at uh, Samhain or Halloween as an opportunity to honor our ancestors uh, and it's the end of our year, um, it's really disturbing to see it so twisted uh, into something that's supposed to scare children or um, to, to cast a bad light on certain types of people. 
So okay. we we work harder at Halloween and Samhain to overcome some of those stereotypes, and we do need that we need to do at Yule or winter solstice. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Yeah, and and you know it's interesting that you mentioned that. I never would have thought of that, but I appreciate your insight there. And of course, as we mentioned early on, if you're interested in more information uh, from Emma uh, or from the the community. Uh, that she's a part of, you can check out. I already found the website, so I checked that out myself, the Labyrinth Temple here in Oklahoma City. Um, Mike, uh, and there it is on the screen, wonderful. Mike, I'm, I'm very much interested for you to share uh, what you have to say, and I'm going to preface this, you know, because this is the educator in me, but I think it's important for people to recognize in particular what Mike is about to say, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there with the assumption, the, the, what I call wrong assumption from a lot of people that America is a Judeo Christian nation. We're not talking politics, so I'm not going to get into that. But what I don't like about that term is it lumps Judaism and Christianity in together, whereas there's some things that are significantly different. And so with that being said, Mike, I wanted to turn it over to you to speak about your perception and how Judaism interacts with Christmas. Yeah, uh, great point that you raised, Adam. Uh, the people who use that term Judeo-Christian <laughs> are Christians. Jewish people, for the most part, do not talk about Judeo-Christian uh, situations. They just, you know, that's just not... Uh, in, in my experience, anyway, with people that mm -hmm. I have known, the Jewish people that I have known, uh, and organizations. Uh, mine goes back to uh, Ponca City, Oklahoma, where I was born, is the first uh, uh, an elementary school, and being the uh, only Jewish uh, uh, young person in mm -hmm. elementary school. Uh, and this, you're talking about the early and mid fifties, I was born in 51. So elementary school, you know, year was uh, mid fifties. And there were always Christmas holidays, parties, there were Christmas plays. And so I grew up with that. And, uh, and obviously my parents were not pleased that, you know, we were in that environment, my brother being uh, four years older than me. Uh, in that environment. So my dad, being the person that he is, went to the school and uh, there were two things and uh, uh, made sure that uh, people understood that there was a Jewish student in this school mm. and that there is a holiday that comes around the same time as Christmas with your Christmas plays and it is Hanukkah. Mm. And that he would like to come and explain it to the students what Hanukkah was and being Jewish was. Wow. Uh, and the school thought that was a great idea, uh, which was wonderful. And, uh, you know, he and my mom came in and they talked about Hanukkah and what that was and, uh, and what uh, Judaism was. And, uh, but they still continued with Christmas plays and stuff. And my dad and I played the violin. So I was in, I had to be in these plays because mm -hmm. I was in the orchestra and my dad would get pretty upset about the fact that that was only uh, that was what was happening. So he sent and said, you know, it's fine that you do this, but it's important that you recognize that there are other faith traditions. And being in Ponca City, uh, Chabon, you will appreciate this. Uh, there was a, a lot of indigenous people in Ponca City because of the Ponca tribe. And uh, and they appreciated the fact, you know, that, uh, that they were there and they didn't necessarily celebrate Christmas in the way that uh, that uh, that Christians did and and celebrated their own uh, tradition at that time. Uh, so my dad was uh, one of those kind of people and wanted to make sure that people understood that there that uh, Christians were not just uh, that because when he came here, uh, he he heard the term Christian nation, you know, that we are a Christian nation. We're hearing that today that people. Uh, say that the founding fathers uh, made this a Christian nation, which is not true. Mm. You can go back and read the founding fathers. They did not ever talk about this being a Christian nation. Uh, so to deal with that on a, uh, at this time of the year, uh, you look around and you say, look, I'm not going to 
Don't say, don't celebrate Christmas. That's your holiday. That's like them telling me, don't celebrate Passover, you right. know? Right. Uh, so I would never do that. But I think that people need to be considerate of the other faiths that exist in this community in Oklahoma. I don't think that most people understand Oklahomans understand that there are lots of traditions that exist and it doesn't have to be a religion. Does it Emma? Uh, yeah. It just doesn't. Uh, people can be spiritual mm -hmm. and be very faith oriented. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so we know that. So it's, 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 it's a tough time of the year. Uh, uh, but we've got our Hanukkah that we go and celebrate, uh, put the menorah up in the window so that people see that we're Jewish right. and that we're celebrating uh, the Festival of the Lights. And uh, it, it's, it's very important. And you brought up Easter and uh, Christmas being the two. And I neglected to mention, of course, uh, uh, probably the next holiday that is so important to Jews, and that's Passover, uh, mm -hmm. when we were freed from Egypt and uh, and what we uh, what the Jews went through in, in, in going through the desert and finally. And then uh, the other one was Shavuot, which I forgot to mention, and that was receiving the Torah from God uh, uh, at Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. uh, but dealing with Christmas, it's, you know, you walk in and people were getting so upset because people started recognizing and saying, okay, instead of saying Merry Christmas, why don't we just say Happy Holidays? And then, of course, the the kickback came from the right, you know, about, you know, it's Christmas. Say Merry Christmas, you know, instead of Happy Holidays. Not not taking into consideration that, hey, we're celebrating something at this time of the year, too. Right. So are other people of other faiths, including Kwanzaa. So, you know, why not say Happy Holidays to whoever it is that you're that you're there? It doesn't mean that you're negating Christmas at all, but you're recognizing what exists in our in our own state here. So yeah. to me, it's a, you know, uh, do I accept when someone says Merry Christmas to me, I don't get upset and start yelling at them. No, uh -huh. but it's uh, unfortunately we live in a state where, you know, uh, that is predominantly Christian. And uh, and I'm not going to, uh, you know, criticize those people who, you know, go out and celebrate Christmas. Uh, just so it's important that they recognize the other four people th uh, that are on this panel discussion tonight and that we are not of that that faith and we don't. Well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that with Chabon. You are uh, to a certain extent with the, with that uh, religious group uh, with the Methodists. So but uh, that uh, there are other people that live here and there are people who don't have any uh, religious you know, atheist and agnostic, you know, that we have a, a large segment in, in, in Oklahoma. And we need to recognize that uh, because they have as much right to practice non-practice, you know, as we do our, our faiths and what we, what we do. So it's fun to celebrate this time of the year. And, uh, and if we only would take what the faiths say about this time of the year, Mm. and follow through with it, which is supposed to be a time of peace at this time. And to look around, and one of the best ways to look about peace is how you treat each other. Wow. And we know what's been going on, you know, recently with that. So if we could take that, then then I would take Christmas and all the other holidays that come in that area, if we could have that, uh, if we could have peace. Beautifully said, Mike, beautifully said. I absolutely agree. Uh, with with your sentiment at the end about peace, that's what's on my shirt written in Arabic. A lot of people probably can't read that, but it says "salam" uh, on my shirt, which is the Arabic word for peace. Speaking speaking of of you know the Jewish views on Christmas, um, I wanted to chime in real quick because the uh, the Muslim views are not much different, except slightly, right? Because in Islam, as a Muslim. And, and as a as a faith community, our theology recognizes Jesus. And not only does our theology recognize Jesus, but our theology has a lot of affection and admiration for Jesus. Jesus is the only 
um, I'm sorry, the mother of Jesus, Mary, is the only woman mentioned by name in the Holy Quran. Jesus is mentioned more than uh, 25 times in the Holy Quran. There are several chapters in our Holy Scripture which are named after Jesus or aspects of his life. So it's a big part of the Islamic theology and faith tradition. However, the celebration of Christmas in and of itself is not a part of Islamic theology. So quite honestly, as a Muslim, this time of the year is for me a reminder to brush up, right, on what my scripture says about Jesus and Mother Mary, to try to remind myself that as a Muslim, as a believer, I am instructed to love Jesus as a prophet of God and Mother Mary as one of the uh, most pious women to ever live. Um, I'm instructed to love them as much as I love the prophet Muhammad. Um, also, by the way, you know, a lot of Muslims, I can't say about other faith communities, but a lot of Muslims are in interfaith marriages. I grew up in a Catholic Muslim home, my mother being Catholic, my father being Muslim. So we grew up celebrating Christmas, right? We had a Christmas tree and we had gifts because that was pretty much half of my family. And Islam as a theology teaches tolerance and understanding. So my father got in the in the in the you know Christmas mood and and love celebrating as well. Of course, as we got older and became more aware and understanding and took our our Islamic faith more seriously, um, you know, it was something that we transitioned out of. But hey, if you want to give me a Christmas gift, I'll take it. You know, if you want to say Merry Christmas, I will say. I hope you have a Merry Christmas and I won't take offense, right? But the most important thing is if you want to give me a gift, um, uh, you know, I, we can just, you know, connect on Facebook and I'll send you my address. You can mail me one. Right? But the, the point is, as Muslims, we don't partake in Christmas actively, um, but we don't have a problem reciprocating. And also we see this as a teaching moment. I mean, as Mike, you know, you mentioned we live in a very diverse country, not just state, but country. And we see this as an opportunity that if our colleagues or our family members invite us for Christmas dinner or want to do a gift exchange, we should reciprocate by inviting them maybe for a Ramadan iftar or maybe to celebrate in the Eid tradition so that we can be bridge builders together and can learn more about each other. Um, since we're getting close to our time limit, I want to come back to you Kwame, and I want to ask you because you mentioned about Kwanzaa and, and that beautiful tradition. Do people who celebrate Kwanzaa also celebrate Christmas? Is it kind of some yes, some no, or is it like an either or type of thing? You're muted. You might want to unmute yourself real quick. There we go. Right. Yeah, you're good. Oh, I can hear you now. Yeah. Uh, it's it's either or people celebrate Christmas. Um, uh, I'm involved in several Christmas activities around Oklahoma City. As a matter of fact, I'm a member of the Ambassadors Choir, which you've probably heard, uh, a choir that is recognized all, not only in, in the state but all over America. And we do a Christmas celebration like every year, and I just sing just as loudly and not loudly. Try to blend in. Thank, thank you with, with 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 the group. But anyway, yes, it's something that uh, if a person can uh, or, or celebrate Christmas, and also we celebrate Kwanzaa. But a Kwanzaa is a celebration that leads into the other aspects of the year, and as I said, it's built upon seven principles, sacred principles, what we call the Saba. The first one is uh, mojo, which means unity. For folks who believe anything cannot happen unless you have unity within the community. Uh, go on to Kuki Jakalia, self determination. Uh, Ujima, which means cooperative economics. Uh, Nia means faith, and mm. so on and so on and so on. But each day, a principle is celebrated where the community comes together. You can you can do it at home around uh, if you have an yeah. altar, so to speak. You can do it there, and there is a seven candles that are lighted for each principal or each day. Or you can do it, or you can make it as a communal activity where you might go with the other people who have similar minds. Thank you, and and celebrate. What we try to do is to bring some type of. Uh, activity or some type of sacredness to our lives which we can communicate with one another in a joyful and a, in a 
sanctimonious manner mm. so we can become a better people uh, as far as building for ourselves. Now, as you know, like this Christmas idea, it was given to, or I can say adopted, or it might be, it was sell upon African people because we were brought to America uh, and we were in, as uh, enslaved people. And mm -hmm. a lot of this doctrine as far as Christianity and things of this nature were when there was not a part of our lives. So it was more like uh, almost forced upon us. Mm -hmm. but yet until since that time, we have accepted it. We are accepted because there are some very good values in Christianity right. that, uh, that, we, that we can incorporate into our life. So we, we did this. We did this. But uh, as far as been <laughs> become, become a, a part of this miracle, diverse society, so to speak. Mm. But uh, as you know, since, since the 60s, that turbulent, that turbulent, turbulent age, when we start uh, looking into ourselves, looking into our past, looking into African spirituality and things of this nature, we try to do something to absorb us as far as what we are as well as a people. Sort of adopting, 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 adopting some of those standards uh, that uh, came from African spirituality, so to speak. Mm. A lot of these concepts are joined, we, you know, the words that we speak. Or the concepts are are involved in um, Swahili words, mm. Swahili words, and they have concepts as far as bringing on uh, what we're trying to uh, come back from more collective unity. And that's a very, very occasion, uh, a very joyful occasion where we have dancing and singing, plays, um, uh, spiritual sand, the whole nine yards. I mean, we, we really do a big. In Oklahoma City. Now, I came from a community about 12 years ago in Atlanta, Georgia, where we also did this. And mm -hmm. it was it was received. As a matter of fact, it's like I said, it's growing like wildfire. Mm -hmm. And we enjoy it. And uh, it's something that we want to African people to participate in. Because it does bring unity and a self-awareness to ourselves as a people. Mm -hmm. of what we can do or, or our objectives in life, which are good positive objectives. So what we need to do and incorporate beautiful beautiful thank you so much wow how insightful and i love i love this discussion you know talk of peace talk of unity talk of understanding this is this is wonderful um Shabon, i have the last question for you which is perhaps the most difficult question of the evening we can't deny the fact that oh I for I, well I didn't mention I was about to say did I mention about my perspective but we talked about sending me a Christmas gift so we're good on that okay <laughs> um, we can't deny the fact that we are a week and two days away from perhaps what is one of the bigger secular holidays like non-religious holidays in America which is Thanksgiving. And of course, you know, everyone looks forward to the turkey, the stuffing, the football games, Black Friday, which has seeped into Thursday. Pretty soon we'll probably be shopping on Wednesday or Tuesday. God knows, you know, what's going to happen. But I feel like we should give you out of respect and out of admiration for who you are and for the communities that you represent the final word on tonight's program about what does Thanksgiving really mean, especially from an indigenous perspective? Because we've all been force fed this story about what Thanksgiving is. And I think we've just taken for granted that this is a holiday. And it's, of course, like many other holidays become mm -hmm. super commercialized. What do you want viewers tonight to leave with heading into the Thanksgiving holiday and to be thinking about? Mm -hmm. No, <clears throat> I believe that one of the most important components that is the foundation of this, this male exchange that happened in history is the understanding of one's place in all of creation, a sense of humbleness, and that there's always a bigger picture. There's always a, a, a sense of, of humbleness when one looks at oneself in all the midst of creation. And that's really why is the, that really is the backdrop of that shared meal. When someone appears 
at your dwelling place that is mm. being harmed and, and hungry, that regardless of their walk of life, that wow. you give everything that you have to give. And I think that's probably the most important thing because even despite the violence of history that has occurred, that in our spiritual practices, mm. we always come back to that foundation. We always come back to that beginning to say, this is how you live in a healthy manner. Now, for us, I would emphasize that that doesn't just mean humanity. That means all mm. components mm. of creation. And to get into the mindset of an indigenous spiritual person, because I have received so many gifts in life that I cannot even begin to count air, water, someone protecting me, on and on and on for in my 43 years of living, I will always do what I can to give. And so that if there's a day like Christmas where we're bearing gifts, I don't have a problem with that. I should have that spirit and, mm. and generosity always to have that to, to give. It's only when we suffer suffering and violence that makes us want to pull back. And so being in a, a, a spiritual person, we come back to that foundation. So that's what I would share is just that knowing that there is such a diversity, we will never know truly how expansive it is. But we are only, we have to recognize mm -hmm. that we are, are only one small piece of the entire cosmos. And so because of that, whenever I break bread with someone, with any of my relatives, no matter what faith tradition you come from, I'm going to take that reverently mm. and I'm going to have joy in that moment. That is the foundation of this meal. And it, as you can already imagine, that's very opposite of uh, capitalistic exploitation. That's the opposite of someone being in charge of the meal. You know, the, the images that we see in elementary schools right now, you know, I don't know how many principals and teachers I've talked to <laughs> over the, you know, my, my oldest is 21 mm. years old over the past 20 years. I was saying, wait a second, this just has nothing to do with us. This is what we're about. So that's what I would like to share because that is the core of our existence as a community that possesses many faiths, many understandings, many ways of existing that has been here for thousands upon thousands of years. Beautiful, beautiful. Siobhan, thank you so much. And I think what a beautiful place to end our conversation. I think can I make a comment, yeah, though? One, one last Emma, comment. Emma, please. Uh, one of the things that's a challenge to my community is that because it's not a mainstream thing, because there's are very few families that are that come up pagan. Okay, it's something you generally are exposed to when you're older, and you may move away from your uh, birth family's traditions. Uh, also, you can, they, because we embrace the wide diversity of uh, expressions and uh, gender mm -hmm. and in sexuality, and um, that has caused a lot of sorrow among uh, people who are practicing paganism paganism because they've been shut out from their birth families, their birth communities, and uh, tolerance is what we practice and and we uh, promote. We would just yeah. like that same consideration, you know, to to be included rather than excluded because you know, we see the beauty, mm. you know, in other traditions. Uh, we see the the power mm. that people bring uh, out of a strong sense of faith and of connection, uh, both to the to the earth or to each other or to a greater concept. But it's very difficult for a lot of pagans to uh, reintegrate into their families uh who if they're not open-minded you know because it's just 
We get called devil worshippers a lot. We don't even have devils in our pantheons. Yeah. There's just yeah. no such thing. You know, it's, right. a, it's basically a Christian concept, right. and we don't have one. So to be, to be shunned because of a misconception, that's, that's harmful around the holidays, be it Thanksgiving or Christmas or the Easter holidays, which we would go with spring equinox. And, you know, it's just we're asked for... Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I have to I have to add on to that, Adam, with the that with the devil, because uh, of course that was one of the myths about Jews that uh, even when I was growing up, that they would come and check my head because they were told that Jewish people had little horns that grew out because we worshipped the devil. So, you know that mm. that that still exists to this day, and that's you know, and 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 that's why what we did tonight is so important that people shared their. Uh, who they are and and why it's so important for people to understand we are not one we are of many and uh, we all deserve the same Absolutely. respect for who we are and what our American. beliefs are i'm no stranger to uh you know misconceptions and misunderstandings of my faith i'm no stranger unfortunately to being called names and being stereotyped and and misrepresented so emma i completely understand Mike, you've made a very valid point. Chavon, thank you for sharing such so beautifully, you know, about who you are and the multiple uh, facets of your identity. And Kwame, thank you for enlightening us on the Kwanzaa uh, holiday and how important that is um, to you and to many people, not just in Oklahoma, but around the world. With that, you know, this conversation could go on and on, but I will tell you what, you see it in the background, the Oklahoma Conference of Churches and our dear friend, executive director of that organization, Reverend Shannon Fleck, if you're interested in more information about interfaith work, the interfaith community, how to build tolerance amongst people of faith or, or, or different traditions, please go to okchurches.org get in touch with the Oklahoma Conference of Churches, join the Religions United Committee, um, and we would love to dialogue with you. We would love to build bridges of tolerance and understanding. And most importantly, we would like to build a world that is better for future generations than the one we inherited, one that is more peaceful, more loving, and more caring. Thank you so much to all our guests. And thank you for those that have joined us. Have a wonderful evening and thank perhaps you. appropriate, as Mike said, to say happy holidays, everyone. Good happy night. holidays.